Welcome to the Intersecting Us podcast, where math and life intersect. In today's episode, Brian and Dave discuss the impact of freedom in math. Well, we are podcasting today from the same place we pretty much always podcast from. It's right in the middle of America, what we would call the breadbasket to uh, the great state of Iowa, which has a lot of vowels in it, I guess. But when you when you think of uh, America, a lot of time, it's really not that time of year for us right now. But when we get into the summer months and, you know, the 4th of July and independence and the word freedom comes to mind. And that's what uh, we're going to talk about today. This is another chapter in the book uh, Mathematics of, for Human Flourishing by Francis Sue. And the, and the chapter title is, of course, Freedom. But freedom can, uh, kind of like justice when we talked about last, last podcast, you know, defining it, we kind of know what it is, but defining it can sometimes be a little more difficult because we got to step back and think about it. So Dave, I'm bringing you in. Uh, how would you, uh, define freedom or at least give us a definition that makes sense to you? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not one that, uh, you know, walks around with Webster in my back pocket. So this is not a Webster dictionary, but it, was a definition that was given to me when I was in college. And if you know anything about like when I was born or anything, that was uh, somewhere between 82 and 86. That's 1982, 1986. And so you do the math. It's a long time ago. And the fact that I can remember this uh, from this long ago, you know, tells you that it, at least something that has stuck with me, that has resonated with me. And uh, the guy who uh, gave it is a, a guy named Josh McDowell, which you may or may not have heard of, but I heard him speak. And this is what I remember about his definition of freedom. And that is, he said, you know, we think of freedom as the freedom to do whatever we want. And that appeals to us because we all, you know, at our core really want to do whatever we want. We don't want someone else to tell us what to do. And that is kind of a lot of what is communicated in America is this idea that we can be free to do what we want. But he said, Josh said that that's really not true freedom. He said, uh, a lot of people are doing that, but he was saying it's like they're not really free. And what he meant by that and what he articulated was that freedom is that they're not really happy. And, you know, I kind of thought about that. It's like, you know, sometimes I could resonate with that, that sometimes just doing what I want isn't like really true freedom because it's not really what I think is important. And what Josh McDowell said was true freedom is identifying what is right and then having the ability to do it. And that was a something that really resonated with me that I wanted to, that was the freedom I wanted to pursue because I didn't want to just do whatever I want in life. I wanted to identify what was most important and then have the ability to do it because being human and, you know, I've got frailties, I've got limitations, I'm selfish. There's all kinds of reasons why sometimes I'm not able to do what I want to do. But I know when I am able to do what I think is most important, that is when I feel like um, I've experienced true freedom. Yeah, and I think that's a very good definition because it, it when you talk about freedom, I think what Josh McDowell had done there is 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 frame it in more of a realistic way, uh, in a practical way, but but it's also kind of deeply philosophical too. Because what we tend sometimes, I suppose, I don't have a Webster's with me either, but I would, you know, you've heard it sometimes. Unlimited choices, you know, if you had unlimited choices, that's true freedom. And anything when I don't have a choice, that's taking away my freedom, so you're left less free. But that that again, that 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 doesn't make sense, really, if you think about it. Uh, and I'll use an analogy. Uh, I don't know who's all for, we can either, you can either say, what college should I go to or what job should I take out of college? Do you really want unlimited choices there? I mean, mm-hmm. do, I mean, you do have them, but look, how many universities are in the world? Do you really want to start with? I don't know how many there are. I mean, 5,000 different places. You know, how long is that going to take you? You'll be dead <laughs> before you decide what college to go to, you know? <laughs> Freedom. And that's where, and here's an analogy, and this is a theological analogy, but it's, it's philosophical too. And you can, it, so if you can think about it again, I, I always have to close my eyes when I do this, but if you're driving in your car, I would just try to do it without closing your eyes. But think of you, you're, you're in the middle of a desert and we're going to go with like a, a, a African desert, you know, sand, you know, sand in every direction. And of course, you know, 
as Dave takes a drink of his drink there because he's getting thirsty and I'm going to take a drink of mine here in a second. You're, you know, you're in the middle of a desert and you can, in one definition, you are completely free. You can go in any direction. And you know, mathematically, you could go degree by degree and get 360 different directions. You can go half degrees. You can do all that kind of stuff. But what happens if you're really in the middle of a desert and you're way away from anything? That's freedom, but it's also death, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because you don't just need freedom as a human. You need more than just freedom, Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, ability and, and good. Well, this is the idea is that freedom for that person, for you, is a sign that says this way to water. Mm-hmm. And the idea there is freedom without life giving things. And you, you, the way he put it, you know, McDowell put it was more ability to choose and, and, and then even going to Francis Sue would be flourishing, which is the name of the book. True freedom is going towards something that gives you life and gives you mm-hmm. flourishing and gives you meaning and gives. So, you know, freedom without anything that is 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 life giving use the word happiness we might use the word joy without that that's not true freedom that's just unlimited mm-hmm. which really is chaos in my opinion unlimited mm-hmm. choice you got to have some sort of parameters or the freedom doesn't have an end it's just meandering mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. you're just wandering in a desert that's not what mm-hmm. what sue is talking about and that's not what what we any of us would really define as freedom we wouldn't define freedom as chaos so but when he talked about freedom, he used another metaphor. He's very good at this. And I don't know if you remember that he used the beach metaphor. And he was talking about, this is Francis Sue, the author of this book, he was talking about volunteering on a Saturday morning to read a book to, I don't know, the, it was like second or third graders, I think, maybe even younger. And he had picked a book about the beach because he was in L.A. thinking, well, they understand the beach. Well, he started reading it and kids weren't really paying attention. And didn't really like it. And he found out out of those 11 kids, only one had ever been to the beach, even though they were 15 miles from it. And he, he talked about all the things that, that made their freedom not possible. And throughout this whole chapter, he uses freedom being this basic human desire that some of these kids weren't free to go to the beach. Both of their parents were. Um, they were in, they didn't, couldn't get 15 miles to go to the beach. There were beach. And then he got into historical things. There were some beaches that were closed to certain ethnic, Minorities. There were all, you know, all these different things he got into when he talked about freedom. And I thought that was really well done. So in, in the, you know, I, you can use the desert metaphor or the beach metaphor, whichever one you want. But I thought that was really good because, you know, for him, he said the beach met, became a metaphor for various freedoms that are hallmarks in doing math. Um, freedoms mm-hmm. delivered to some and denied to others. And that's what he was talking, mm-hmm. which kind of comes off the justice chapter really good. Mm hmm. Uh, interesting. I'm not sure if this completely r- relates to uh, this topic, but perhaps it, it w- but it just struck me in our last podcast, I was talking about my trip to India. And uh, one thing that surprised me in my trip to India was we went along some of the beaches there. And what happens in India at the beaches is that, at least the ones we were at, it was a place for the homeless to live. And so they would have a tent there, and that's where they lived. And then you know, they would fish there to get food. But it was a really dirty, messy, ugly, to be honest, place. And it was depressing to see. And it was two different worlds. You know, in America, we think of beaches as uh, maybe the ultimate freedom to get away, to experience life and joy. And then I, you know, go to India and you see for them, uh, the beaches is a form of survival. And so anyway, that's, that's two different perspectives of what it means to go to the beach. But, uh, it was eye opening to me to, to think of about it in terms of, well, some people just need food to eat and that, and, uh, you know, water will provide that for you. Well, and I think, as you said, you know, that definition you gave at the beginning of the podcast or, or the, the, the concept of freedom, part of that is the ability to carry it out. And obviously, mm-hmm. some of these people, whether it's the, the kids that hadn't been to the beach or these homeless that you saw, the, uh, there was no ability there. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's that's again, if you're going to give people freedom, they have to have ability to use either the resources they have or the talents intrinsic mm-hmm. in their life. And that's kind of what he got into here. That it, it kind of came off the justice chapter and he got into the idea that there are some people who, who the, the, they don't have that much freedom to mm-hmm. do 
do those things that a lot of us do have. And again, you can see that as permeating the whole book, the idea that he thinks, well, I think he, he, he thinks he, he really thinks he knows that this is part of who we are as people. We should be helping other people to, to be able to find those freedoms too. And, and he did such a good job because he ended up uh, in being math guys. Uh, I'm always, you know, last, last, in the last chapter, we had two things to look at for justice. In this one, we have five things, five different freedoms, and we don't have to hit them all, but they all make sense. First one was freedom of knowledge, the idea of being just able to get the information. And again, that kind of maybe goes back a little bit to having the opportunity to just get the knowledge. Freedom to explore. And we've hit this before. We had a whole chapter on exploration, a whole mm-hmm. podcast, you know, freedom to explore in math. That makes a lot of sense. You can explore, try different ways of doing the same thing. You know, you, you talked about the different ways of proving one particular type of theorem and all those types of mm-hmm. things. And then the freedom of understanding. I'll, I'll go back to that one because I think that one really resonated with me. The freedom to imagine, that one really raised, raised me, you know, to imagine things. Um, and, mm-hmm. we're gonna, and then the freedom to welcome. And I, we'll probably end with that one, or maybe we'll talk about it before. But that was interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't think I would have thought that one up. That's why mm-hmm. Sue's writing the book and I'm not. But uh, <laughs> but the freedom of understanding, I, I, I remember missing, when I was a sophomore in high school, I missed two weeks because of an illness. And, and I missed geometry, uh, some, some core geometry things. And I remember going in there and acting kind of like I understood, but I just didn't have the first clue what they were talking about. Because I just didn't have the, the base. They were, because it was essentially like you would, like if, you know, I don't know if a good example, you go in and we're going to use these six words in, in most of our sentences, but I missed the class what all those six words meant. And so they keep using the words. I don't know what they mean. And that's kind of the way I felt. And finally, but he, he talked about that in the freedom of knowledge, <laughs> or excuse me, freedom of understanding. You, you continue to feel like an imposter. <laughs> you believe that everybody else knows what's going on, and they're the only one that does it. And I think maybe we've all been there sometimes, maybe not in geometry and sophomore year of high school, but, but just because of the circumstances, it was there. And getting to the point where I could finally say I understood, I had to go to the, to the teacher and say, I don't know what's going on. And yeah. and it kind of made me think back to the justice one of last week, how, you know, if I would have been tested, I probably I don't even know if I'd have got a, a D because mm-hmm. I just didn't understand the underlying concepts. But once mm-hmm. I understood it, then I, you know, I was fine, you mm-hmm. know, but that's the freedom of understanding the idea that once you really understand the concept, then how much freedom do you have to do things with it? Mm-hmm. If you don't even understand the concept, you can't do much with it. And I thought that right. he hit that 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 really hard. But but coming on those, did any of those resonate with you more than others? The knowledge, exploration, understanding, imagine, or welcome? Well, it's been a while since we've actually done some real math here. So I think now is the time to uh, there you change. Go. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm going to talk about the number. Well, let's talk about the freedom first of the working with, let's say, triangles and the Pythagorean theorem. So like the Egyptians and other cultures, they they knew about the formula of the Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So they used it to solve problems. But the Greeks, they took the freedom to not just use it to solve a problem. They took the freedom to ask, well, why is it true? And so they dug into trying to prove that it was true. And of course, they did come up with the proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And that has changed math uh, forever since. And that began this whole idea of asking kind of like why. The Greeks also had the freedom to look at other conic sections like uh, they would look at like an ellipse. And so they studied circles and ellipses. And then, you know, another 2000 years later, Kepler identifies that ellipses happen to be how planets orbit around the sun. And so, you know, what an ironic thing is that the Greeks took the freedom to study ellipses because they're part of a conic section and not really worrying about too much about why they should study it. They thought it was cool. And then we find out it uh, connects to, uh, you know, how our universe is built. And the one that I want to kind of zone in on is the simple concept of a circle and pi. And I think we all have an idea of what pi is because it's a button on our calculator and we can press it. And it's going to give us so many digits of what that number is. But 
we have the freedom in math to think about pi in a different way. And actually, pi really isn't what you see on your calculator, because what pi is, it's a relationship between the distance around a circle and the distance across the circle. So that ratio equals pi. And pi, of course, is just a made up name that we have come up with. So there is no such thing as pi, but there is such thing as the relationship. And the cool thing is, is that relationship is true for all circles. So that's an idea that we've had the freedom to explore, to look at circles and say, wow, they all have this same relationship. And we can give this relationship a name, call it pi. And, you know, uh, we can start calculating it. But we also have the freedom to understand, well, what kind of number is this? What is this number? And as history, we would go through and try to find more and more digits. And, you know, pretty soon we found out it was more than just 3.14 or 22 over 7. We dug deeper and they would find five digits, 10 digits. But then later on, what we identified was that pi was an irrational number. Well, an irrational number now is a totally different kind of a number. Then, and so it's not a matter of finding that next digit. I mean, that's kind of fun to do, but in math, we have the freedom to identify that it's a different category of numbers and it's irrational. And so now it's in this category of number where there is an infinite number of digits. And, you know, talk about freedom. I mean, there's digits going out forever to describe pi. And yet, of course, it is a specific number. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that, that pi is extremely specific. It It is one number. And where did that number come from? You know, that these are questions that we in math, we, we have the freedom to ask. And, and so I find it very interesting to think about not how many digits there are, but why are there an infinite number? And, you know, who's in charge of pi? Who, who is the one that came up with this idea of pi? And, you know, I, uh, so I went on a, a little bit of trail of a lot of different thoughts about that, but that was just kind of like an illustration of the freedom we have in math because we're not constrained by the things in the physical world. We can talk about things in the abstract world in the physical world. Pi does have a limit because whatever tool we measure is going to be bigger than the plane constant. So it's going to come to a number and it's going to end. But in this abstract world, we get the freedom to go wherever math leads us. And it's really cool to find what math reveals when we start uh, actually looking at the mysteries that are embedded in simple things like a circle. Well, and I think you've got the constraints are gone. Unlike physical sciences, like you said, you don't have Mm -hmm. the constraints. You can, you you have a little bit more and that's kind of, that probably goes in the two types of freedom he talked about would be exploration, you know, but the other one was imagination, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and and I think that he used a couple examples I thought were good and, you know, pi would be one of them. And, you know, we talked about, it looks like, and Einstein kind of dealt with this too, that there's like these universal constants, you know, you see that in some other things too, you know, the, the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force and all those types of things that uh, it just kind of impose themselves on us, kind of like Pi does. But Sue used the idea of topology and how he getting in there about mm-hmm. practicing imagination. But the one that kind of resonated with me was the, the sand castle on the beach. <laughs> that was kind of cool. You know, you know, you see the sand and you got, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever calculated the number of grains of sand in, in the world or anything, but think about the different how your imagination can go to different types of forms, which is kind of goes into topology, which is what topology is kind of about is those forms that you can do. And you, you know, and, and math helps us with the imagination. It's not like, well, I'm going to go over here and do math, but then I'm going to go build a sandcastle. And then now I get to use my imagination. No, it's, it, he's mm-hmm. saying, no, that uh, mathematics can help you uh, develop, I guess would be the best mm-hmm. word your imagination because it allows you to see things and gives you the freedom back to our word to see things in ways that other disciplines can't because they do have constraints Mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, actually I hadn't thought about this until you just mentioned it, but the whole idea of topology, that subject 
didn't originate until the 1700s uh, from, you know, one of our favorite guys, Euler. And Euler was the one that really kind of kickstarted topology. And what's interesting was that he started working with looking at the same shapes that the Greeks looked at 2000 years before. And he uh, had the freedom to look at them differently. And what he was looking at wasn't necessarily measuring them. He wasn't interested in the numbers of it. He was looking for the different shapes and characteristics of like triangles or spheres or donuts. And so that was just asking a different question. And so often in math, we think it's all about numbers, where topology isn't about numbers. It's about properties of shapes. And what's funny is that as good as the Greeks were about asking the question why, this was a subject they totally missed. And it's not like it wasn't like advanced enough to understand it. They were smart enough to to discover topology. They just missed it. And so but Euler came around and just asked the right questions. And, you know, it's, they weren't like rocket science questions. They're questions we can understand now. But he happened to have the freedom to to ask it. And so a whole new subject has taken place. And what's kind of cool is that we're finding that this subject topology really answers a lot of the questions deep into the DNA of our universe. Like, uh, how is our universe put together at the macro level out in space and at the micro level, like in string theory? And so people that are studying those kinds of questions must be well versed in topology and topology is a study that has nothing to do with numbers and uh it really came about because a very imaginative person named Euler asked the right questions and, and yeah that is just cool because I, when you say topology it brings back it just is not really a story just information i my advisor and professor at Simpson College go storm was he this was he was a computer science not not a math teacher at the time but his doctorate was in topology and so when we were i i had a math major and a computer science major but but we would ask him, well what's topology and he's like he always said the same thing because you know he'd say well it's mathematics using silly putty <laughs> i'll never forget that because it is, it's kind of, you know, it, topology is, it's like, you know, study of the properties of what geometric shapes that change and stretch and you, you can't, you know, yeah. that's kind of what it is. And so, I mean, what a great way to put it, because I'll never forget what topology is because of Marvan White talking about it being silly buddy. You know? So it's again, or, you know, and then, of course, Sue uses sand, which would, you know, and he's really not, he wasn't really talking about topology when he's talking about sand. He was talking about Im uh, imagination, how many different things you can do. And I, I think we've seen so much. Euler's always really helpful with that because he was so good at that of how much imagination entered into their mathematics. And I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, 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 we've talked about that in earlier podcasts, but again, we here we see it again. The freedom of imagination is much more overt and observable in the math than it is in science and some of the other, especially mm -hmm. physical sciences, but, but it's mm -hmm. neat to see that it gets used quite a bit, but. Uh, so when you look at these one and, and we don't have to end with this one, but I, I just wanted to talk about just at least and get maybe uh, 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 pick your mind a little bit on the freedom of welcome. Uh, that was hmm. not that is the term I'll have to admit I had not heard before. And, and it's of welcome. And, and, and he said this is a freedom that's missing from many math communities. And, mm -hmm. and, and he hit this a little bit the week before the, in the chapter before that we talked about last week in the with the justice. Do you remember that one? Is that one that the welcome one? It's just different. The other ones kind of fit, but that welcome one to kind of kind of smack me. I thought that was it was it does, yeah. And maybe I'll answer it this way: is that I mentioned this in the previous podcast? Is that I I've started a book club on math, and it's pretty wide open as to who is welcome to join, and it is specifically wide open because. What I want to do is encourage people to realize that math is uh, a wide net. And as part of the human race, we are in this world of math. It's, it's everywhere we are at. And so just being humans makes us people who do and think of math. And 
we don't always realize it because it's so much part of uh, just simple parts of life. You know, if you happen to look at a clock that is uh, has, you know, the long and s- shorthand, you're doing some heavy duty math just by telling time. And, I, you know, one of the reasons why we're involved with intersecting us is we want to invite more people into the conversation of the mega story of what math is about. And it's not about being good with textbooks, but math is something that's very beautiful and it reveals so many things like we all we just talked about with pi. I mean, that that is a beautiful idea and it opens up a freedom of lots of interesting questions that everyone should feel welcome to ask and think about. And uh, I think so many people think they're not good at math because they don't score well on tests, but that's such of a poor picture or indicator of people's math abilities. And so I think that if anything else, if we can encourage people to help them see that they are math people, uh, that they have math abilities, then, you know, we've accomplished something good. Well, it it almost came down to the, you know, we, we talk about philosophy, we talk about math, life, it almost came down to the psychology of things when he was talking about it. And again, he's a professor, but he was talking about the kind of the pedagogical, you know, how do you teach kids or you know, adults? But, you know, he said you can, he talked about teachers who would practice the, the, the freedom of welcome. He said, you know, they get to know their kids. They get to mm-hmm. know their backgrounds. They get to know not just their academic performance, but their, their families and, the whole thing and, and the way he put it, if I remember right, that it was trying to root education in community, uh, mm-hmm. which is kind of what you're doing with the math club. You know, it, it, and again, I know sometimes if you're if you're good at math or if you're good at whatever your discipline is, you're like, well, I don't want you know to do the work for everybody else. And, and that's not really the that wasn't the idea. It was try to help people flourish. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the idea of, of he said that when he went into a classroom, he wanted every every student to to. To hear this, right? He wouldn't say it, but he wanted to treat them that way that they believe that I believe you can succeed and I'm going to help you get there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's what he saw as the freedom of welcome that you mm-hmm. felt like I might not be as intellectually gifted as the person beside me. I might not have the academic background of the person on the other side of me, but that teacher and maybe the two people I just talked about beside me actually give a hoot on whether or not I feel welcome. And then I can use my gifts and talents. Maybe they might be divergent from others to to flourish, to have joy, and 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 give them the freedom to do that. And I think mm-hmm. that he he talked about a couple examples in the whole book about when you just give people freedom to explore and imagine and the, and welcome them. That's when you start finding innovation, and not just innovation, but but community and. Well, I guess joy would be a good word, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and right. So that I, I thought okay. I just like the way he put that. I, I would not have ever thought myself to put the freedom of welcome in the five list. And right. So I would have well, stopped it. I, I can another way I look at that is uh and this is an example that may resonate more with our actuarial friends here. You know, I talk about pi and and you know, that's kind of like a cool thing. But another number that is right next to pi is E. And as actuaries, uh, we use E all the time. That's often used for like exponential growth. And so as actuaries, that comes in, you know, to play, whether we're talking about compound interest or the coronavirus spreading, uh, it's, it's a way to model exponential growth. And so as actuaries, that formula is in, baked into so many formulas we have to learn. But, uh, if you, once you understand exponential growth and that process is, then you have the freedom to use that concept for other areas of life that use that same exponential process. And surprisingly, that shows up in so many different areas. Uh, you know, I just got done talking about uh, the planets and uh, orbiting around the sun as an ellipse. Baked into that uh, formula is about exponential curves. And so if you understand E, you are now have the freedom to understand better how the planets go around the sun. Another example that's pretty cool is music. You know, you wouldn't think 
compound interest and music are related, but they're related by the number E in that they both talk about exponential growth. Or In music, it's the octaves are exponentially um, set apart. And so these concepts that you learn in one discipline will give you the freedom to apply them in another uh, field. And so I'm not a singer. I know very little about music, but because I've studied E as an actuary, I feel welcome to be able to have conversation with musicians. And I do it all the time. I, I talk with them and I feel welcome to have these conversations. And even though they know way more about music than I do, there's things I know about music that they don't just because I understand the exponential process and understand the math. And and that's the cool thing is, is that it opens the door for me to to be able to connect with people that are quite different than me, have different skill sets. And yet math has this uh, common ground that touches you know, so much of humanity. And it just gives us a, a touching point to, to be welcome with people. And I think that's it. Welcome with people. And the idea that he has done throughout this whole book, including freedom, is the idea of relationship that, you know, he said toward the end of this chapter that, you know, he doesn't define freedom as the absence of constraints and do whatever you want, you know, mm-hmm. um, because that that can be so self-serving and it can be done without outside of community it can be done in an arrogant way there's all the different things that can happen but and, and so he he said you you know you got to work at this you know it's just something that the f- true freedom doesn't come without some cost but the cost is worth it we kind of we talked about struggle of, of, of a few uh, podcasts ago well if the struggle's worth it if there's there's something there and this in this case it would be freedom and the different options and relationship and then responsibility we we're, we're, you know we're responsibility you know, to other people, you know, because it's part of what the community is. It's part of the relationship. So I really like the way he he does this, you know, that if you, you know, a teacher that pours their life into different students, that's a cost. Um, mm. and, and they're responsible for trying to do a good job. But it's it really comes back down to the relationship and that and to, to, to free the kid, free their mind, free their 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 gifts and their abilities. And, you know, to see maybe a little smile on a kid that shows, you know, you can do this. And we've all, if we've experienced that, that that's what freedom brings. Mm-hmm. Freedom brings true relationship and joy and certainly meaning, which is kind of what we're all about. So, yeah, another good chapter, right? <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. Yeah, this is one, like you said at the beginning, we could probably talk about this one a very long time because it's deep, it's wide. And math is so baked into these concepts of freedom that, uh, you know, because people will say that math is the universal language. We, we like to think English is, and that's close to it, but really it comes down to math is the universal language. And we all have the same, uh, we can show a picture of a right triangle and we all understand what that is. We could draw a picture of a circle, no matter what culture we are. We understand what that is. And so it gives us the freedom to, you know, to connect and communicate with others from different backgrounds, different cultures. And, you know, that that's just really cool. Yeah. And so that that is so it may be a bit of a challenge to end this this, uh, for all of us, including you and I, Dave, that, you know, if you can think of someone in your life that did help you was give you some was at some cost to give you some freedom to to grow, you know, maybe give them a call or send them an email or a text and say thanks. And then maybe in your life, if you've got a, an ability to maybe give the freedom, welcoming freedom and, and uh, imagine freedom to, to someone, uh, maybe this week you could think about doing that uh, mm-hmm. because that is really what this whole book is about. And really what we are at Intersecting Us is to try try to help people really understand their life, use their imagination, explore and have some true joy in meeting which uh, and freedom, of course, to do those things. This has been the Intersecting Us podcast. To further engage with Intersecting Us, go to intersectingus.com. dot com.